Good morning, everyone, dear ladies and gentlemen, esteemed colleagues and distinguished speakers. Welcome to the fifth annual meeting of the European Sepsis Alliance. Thank you so much for being with us here today and also to all the people joining uh, online. Today, we will hear from several high-profile speakers from the European institutions, from uh, medical experts, and also a patient uh, advocate. We are also very active on Twitter, so please uh, uh, feel free to um, follow our activities and posts on Twitter using also the hashtag StopSepsisEU. Uh, this event is very timely and is also, uh, it builds on the activity uh, of last week uh, that it marked the, the World Sepsis Day. Uh, indeed, sepsis is a global health crisis and a major challenge for, for patient safety, uh, affecting between 47 and 50 million people every year, and at least 11, people, uh, 11 million uh, die, uh, meaning one death every 2.8 seconds. And 20% of all deaths worldwide are associated with sepsis. And also many um, surviving patients suffer from consequences uh, of sepsis for the rest of their lives. But as you all know, sepsis can be prevented uh, by reducing infections uh, through hand hygiene, through vaccination, and er also early recognition uh, involving strategy to raise awareness about sepsis, but also ensuring that healthcare professionals and also healthcare systems across Europe are fully equipped uh, to treat sepsis as an emergency. So uh, today's uh, event uh, is a great opportunity to facilitate uh, the exchange of practices. Uh, we will hear from um, uh, several high profile panelists uh, about the current challenges and opportunities and, and how ultimately we can work together um, in the fight against sepsis to save lives and also to protect and further enhance the patient safety. I'm really looking forward to hearing their presentations and discuss really concrete recommendations on how to enhance the 70.7 um, .7 World Health Assembly resolution on improving sepsis prevention, diagnosis, and clinical management. Before we start, uh, I will give you some brief uh, housekeeping rules. I'm fully aware that you are uh, quite expert in the Zoom world of virtual meetings, so this is a, a very short, uh, gentle reminder. This meeting is being recorded, um, and we will capture everyone's uh, uh, presentations and main highlights of today's discussions in a short report, which will be available on the European Sepsis Alliance uh, uh, website after the meeting. Please also, uh, I kindly ask you to stay on mute while the speakers are presenting. And uh, because we want also to make uh, this uh, debate as interactive as possible, uh, please use the chat window where you can, uh, of course, submit your questions that we will collect after the, the panel session. And also we will collect, of course, uh, questions from the, the audience here present in the room with me. So without further ado, uh, I now hand the floor to the first speaker, um, Evangelos uh, Giamarellos, who is the chair of the European Sepsis Alliance. Evangelos is uh, specialized in internal medicines and in infection diseases. He's a professor of internal medicines at the Medical School, School of the National and Capodistrian University of Athens, and also guest professor in the Center for Sepsis Control and Care of the Jena University hospital in Germany. Evangelos is a chairman of the European Sepsis Alliance and also president of the European Shock Society and also coordinator of the Hellenic Sepsis Study Group. Uh, he will join us um, virtually and uh, I hope now we can um, welcome him to and take the floor. Please, Evangelos, the floor is yours. Thanks. Thank you very much. Welcome everyone, thank you very much for your uh, uh, warm words and uh, the, the next five minutes I would like to acquaint you a bit uh, with exactly what is the scope of the European Sepsis Alliance and what we want to achieve. As a matter of fact, uh, we were born by an initiative coming from the Global Sepsis Alliance and uh, in 2017 uh, the uh, WHO uh, adopted the resolution 
on improving the prevention, diagnosis, and clinical management on, on sepsis in collaboration with the global sepsis. At that time point, GSA decided to set up regional analysis, mirroring the WHO regional office in order to focus resources on the implementation of this resolution. And then in 2018, under the auspices of the former European Commissioner for Health, Dr. Andrew Quaitis, we were born. Since then, we struggle to make European policymakers and stakeholders to understand the real burden of sepsis and the importance to integrate sepsis in national and European policies. However, the inclusion of sepsis in the Global Burden of Disease Study, the increasing support of WHO European Regional Office, the inclusion of sepsis in the recent conclusions of the G4 leaders have contributed to place now sepsis on this agenda. As a physician, I experienced well this COVID-19 pandemic. And for us who are dealing daily for patients with sepsis, we realized from the very beginning that COVID-19 is sepsis, which is due to virus. Why that? Because the definition of sepsis is a reaction of the human body to an infectious agent which leads to fulminant organ dysfunction. And that was the case of COVID-19. And now everybody understands why our vision is so important, because we need to combat this main and number one culprit for death nowadays in the world. Several member states have undertaken concrete action to implement the recommendations of the uh, WHA resolution. Today, we will hear from Germany, Sweden, and France, who are leaders in Europe in, the, in improving the quality of sepsis care. Lack of data and monitoring of sepsis is an obstacle to quality improvement. Considering the links between sepsis and infection prevention and control, antimicrobial resistance, patient safety, infectious diseases, pandemic preparedness, we will should also try to answer the question whether sepsis management should be one of the key indicators of the performance of health system. Today, we have a special honor. We have with us the European Commissioner who will address and she will enlighten on the recognition of policymakers for the importance of the topic and the, lead, and the need to find common solutions to mitigate sepsis-related harm. Thanks to the permanent representation of Germany to the EU uh, for hosting us, we are grateful to that. And we need to recognize and to pay special tribute to them, since Germany is amongst the leaders in Europe in the fight against sepsis, and we are grateful for them. So I'm wishing the best for this conference and the most important is that we ask you to stay with us, not just today, but to join us in this continued effort for the global recognition and of course the European recognition of sepsis as the number one lethal entity, something that we learned very well through the COVID-19 pandemic, but we need to sustain and struggle against that and we are in need of this joint effort and of your help. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Evangelos, for providing this very powerful message and your, these uh, open remarks uh, with, with us uh, today, and also for highlighting the, the uh, fantastic work that the European and the, the Global Sepsis um, Alliance have been doing over the, the, the past years uh, in, the, in the field of sepsis and also to, to enhance uh, better uh, sepsis prevention, uh, diagnosis, and, and uh, clinical management across Europe. And as you uh, already um, pointed out, I'm really Really delighted to now give the floor to the Commissioner for, for Health and Food Safety, uh, Stella Kiriakides. It's a real honor to have you um, with us um, here today. So now the, the floor is yours. Thanks. Thank you so much. Thank you for the kind invitation. Uh, 
and to all the distinguished speakers and guests and ladies and gentlemen. As uh, you have previously noted yourselves, last week we marked World Sepsis Day to raise awareness around a threat that claims the lives of about 680,000 people in Europe. That is actually more than the population of Luxembourg uh, each year. The facts and figures around sepsis in the EU and worldwide are really um, sober when we read them. Uh, and we estimate that even before COVID-19 uh, pandemic, possibly one in five deaths worldwide was linked to sepsis. And as uh, we all know, COVID-19 has made uh, this situation much worse. We also estimate that one in five sepsis cases is linked to healthcare acquired infections. Now, since it was founded in uh, 2018, the European Sepsis Alliance has really worked tirelessly, and I want to commend you for your, for your efforts to raise awareness and reduce deaths caused by sepsis. So I'm truly uh, delighted to be with you today because it's crucial that we um, try and address this global threat by working together. Firstly, and this is a key lesson from the COVID-19 pandemic, we need to make our health systems more res resilient. In recent years, uh, an aging population, an increased burden from chronic disease, uh, and have increased the demand uh, and the complexity of care. And here too, the pandemic has again shone a spotlight on the healthcare workforce shortages and has disrupted access to non-COVID care, for example, in the case of can cancer diagnosis and treatment. Uh, I see our response developing across three main axes. Firstly, the understanding and the far-reaching health impacts of the pandemic. Secondly, locking in the advantages of digital innovation in healthcare delivery. And thirdly, we need to rethink health workforce strategies and planning. One vital EU-wide response is the recovery and resilience facility. This is a 723 billion euro fund, uh, which will help member states be able to recover, but also to build back better from the pandemic, focusing on the green and the digital transition. And health investment is a key pillar. So far, 25 member states have adopted national plans tailoring investments to their specific needs. And together, they have earmarked over 42 billion euro for improving health and building more effective, accessible and resilient health systems. To give you one specific example, under its national plan, Romania will upgrade existing infectious disease facilities, set up new laboratories and purchase new equipment. We also take action to the challenge of sepsis in other key areas, such as patient safety, antimicrobial resistance, and research into infection prevention and new antimicrobials. Let's first look at patient safety. We have actively helped to implement the 2009 Council recommendation on patient safety. For instance, we have supported the joint action on patient safety through the EU health program. Fewer healthcare acquired infections mean fewer cases of sepsis acquired infections. The heightened risk of patients in intensive care units developing sepsis is very worrying. And we must do all we can to keep it in check through prevention and infection control. And this is why the Alliance's work is so very important in spreading the word, in raising awareness about sepsis among patients among general practitioners and other health workers and policymakers. Anyone who has heard me speak about antimicrobial resistance before will know that it is a mission priority for my mandate. The nexus of AMR to sepsis is an area where we can and we must do better. On top of the EU funding to tackle AMR, which indirectly helps fighting sepsis as well, we're preparing a new joint action on AMR and healthcare associated infections with all EU member states and other countries participating in the EU for Health program. 
with a 50 million euro budget. This will be an action that will make a significant contribution to battling AMR and healthcare associated infections for years to come. Alongside this, we're planning to boost the 2017 One Health Action Plan against AMR, including a proposal for a council recommendation in the coming months. As regards international action, we're working on an EU, a new EU global health strategy uh, and working with key partners like WHO. Looking ahead, the European Health Union will offer us more opportunities for tackling sepsis. COVID-19 has shown us the benefits of preparing and responding together for health crisis, of stepping up coordination at EU level and revising processes and structures. Building on lessons learned, we put together a legislative package to build a strong European health union. And this has several features. Firstly, it bolsters the mandates of the European Centre for Disease Prevention and Control, ECDC, and the European Medicines Agency, EMA. Notably, ECDC's new mandate also covers patient safety. For example, in case of a cross-border threat from communicable diseases, the Centre should work with member states to prevent transmission and safeguard patients in the need of therapy using a substance of human origin. Secondly, the, the health union brings structural changes to the EU health security framework through cross-border health threats legislation, which also focuses on AMR. And in addition, for the health union, we have created a new authority, the new European Health Emergency Preparedness and Response Authority, or HERA, which will carry out activities related to the development and the procurement of antibiotics. Funding for these new policy initiatives is uh, assured, thanks to the 5.3 billion um, budget of the EU for Health program. So running from 2021 to 2027, the program extends beyond crisis response to address healthcare resilience as well. Ladies and gentlemen, as your annual conference rightly suggests, successful managing sepsis must be central to our constant efforts to offer Europe citizens the highest quality care. I know that I could count on the European Sepsis Alliance to continue helping us so that we can build the, and the future together with confidence. So I want to thank you again for this opportunity to share some thoughts with you. I want to wish you a very successful conference and I look uh, very much forward to welcoming you in person to Brussels. Thank you. Sincere, sincere thanks to Commissioner Selakirakides. It has been a really an honor to, to have you and to listen to your um, overall um, and insightful presentations, intervention about the major milestones of the EU um, uh, um, health agenda, but also understanding more about the, the priorities uh, um, of, of the near future when it comes to, to patient safety and also antimicrobial resistance. Thank you so much. And now it's time to go into greater detail and, and uh, we will hear very interesting data uh, on uh, the, the incidence uh, of sepsis and also the impact of antimicrobial resistance uh, on sepsis management in Sweden. So I'm really delighted to welcome Adam um, Linder from Lund University in Sweden um, to, on the stage. Adam is coordinator of the European Sepsis Alliance Research Working Group. He's also professor for infection medicines and a specialist in infection diseases uh, with a position as a senior consultant and senior lecturer at the Clinic for Infection Diseases at Lund University Hospital in Sweden. Um, his research interest lies in epidemiology, early diagnostics, novel treatment options, and long-term outcomes of sepsis. Adam is also one of the initiators of Combat Sepsis, a Swedish network for transnational sepsis research, and is also the founder of Sepsis Fonden.
and is being coordinated in his, in his region, the, the Skåne region in, in Sweden, the, uh, the national, uh, the regional sepsis uh, strategy. So we're really keen to, to hear from you, Adam. Thank you so much, Laura, for this kind introduction, and thank the organizers for inviting me. Um, let's see if I have a presentation here. Yeah, so thank you very much. I will t uh, talk a little bit about the lack of data on sepsis uh, regarding awareness, care, incidence, and the potential impact of antimicrobial res resistance. So, as you all know, there is an unmet need to improve sepsis care and man management, and we all know uh, or are familiar with the WHO sepsis resolution from 2017. And some bullet points, what they pointed out needs to be done is to increase the awareness of sepsis, improve the quality of management of sepsis patients in Europe, and also create a better estimation of the sepsis incidence and the impact of AMR on sepsis in Europe. So why is this a challenge or a problem? I, I'm from Sweden and we have been working on this, so I will give you some examples from my home country then. In 2015, 21% of the Swedish adult population had heard about sepsis. So how could we change this, we thought. One thing was to increase awareness through national public, cam public campaigns that we did with Sepsis Fonden. And actually, in this slide, you can see that Swedes are quite well educated concerning um, uh, most uh, di diseases like uh, myocardial infarction, breast cancer, stroke, prostate cancer, a chronic obstructive lung uh, disease, it's about 90% that has heard uh, of these diseases. But sepsis, it was only 21% in, in uh, 2015, and six years later, it was actually 49%. And I know that the, the, the numbers is even higher in countries like Germany and the U UK, where they have been working on uh, with public na uh, national campaigns for a long, longer time. So th there is a great opportunity to increase uh, awareness uh, on sepsis. So healthcare. We know from audits and surveys in Sweden that we have great national variations in the identification and management of sep sepsis. So how can we tackle this deficit? Well, in 2019, the Swedish government actually chose sepsis as one of 10 medical con conditions for a national standardized healthcare process uh, program starting in 2021. And that includes uh, implementation of sepsis alerts and follow up clinics in all hospitals in Sweden. And this, will, this has been uh, uh, approved, and the, the implementation has started this fall. So, lastly, but not uh, leastly, the sepsis incidence. Why is this a challenge or problem? Well, there are actually very few studies, and there is no ongoing sur surveillance of the incidence of sepsis in Europe or of the impact of AMR on sepsis. We have the problem with ICD coding. If, uh, the ICD coding, uh, the codes that the doctor uh, sets on the patient is, is very, very inaccurate and poor. At, at least in Sweden, it's only about 10 or 15, 20 percent of the sepsis cases that received a correct sepsis ICD di di diagnosis. And the quality probably differs between uh, other U European countries. We, d we don't know that. Also, the majority of sepsis patients are actually treated outside the I see you. In Sweden, 90 or more than 90% of the sepsis cases are treated outside the ICU in intermediate care, infectious diseases wards, or regular wards. So you cannot re rely on the numbers of sepsis cases in the I ICU. You have to check the whole hos hospital. And also, a little bit strange that we have actually no common definition for community-acquired infections. And 
Again, lastly, we don't know the association with and the impact of AMR on sepsis. So how can we tackle this? This has been a priority uh, project uh, within the European Sepsis Alliance since a couple of, of years, and we want to conduct a high-quality European sepsis incidence study based on AC, uh, ICD coding, but also the gold standard, which is manual chart reviews. And we have interest from uh, yeah, the whole of Euro Europe and the e EU to conduct the study, but we lack funding, and we were also delayed by the COVID pa pandemic. But I will give you a brief uh, um, insight in, into the study. It's a two-armed approach linking ICD code di uh, discharge diagnosis to a gold standard of clinical chart re reviews. And we will then randomly select the charts with different ICD codes for sepsis, for organ dysfunction, for infection, and non-infection. -in and go through a couple of hundred or thousand charts with a structured and uh, common definition of in in infection. And from this, you can calculate actually a more proper sepsis in incidents. And I will give you an example. We did a pilot uh, on, um, uh, uh, from Sweden, uh, hospitalizations in two, uh, 2019, and uh, we, from a region in Sweden, all hospitalizations were uh, retracted. That was uh, around 300,000 patient uh, di diagnosis, and from this we selected randomly 1,000 uh, patient charts went through them and the results show that 4.1% of, of all hospitalizations in Sweden is uh, patients had uh, or fulfilled the criteria for sepsis 3. That's almost 1 in 20 patients in hospitals have sepsis. Uh, and we validated this in 20, uh, from patients uh, from 20, 2020 and then the result was 4.6% within the same confidence in interval, and also when including COVID-19 sepsis, uh, the, the percentage rose to 7% of all hospitalizations are due to sepsis, so it's a lot. And we could calculate the sepsis incidence based on, on this, uh, which was 747 per 100,000, and that's actually uh, the same incidence as we have for cancer in Sweden. So sepsis is uh, equally uh, common as cancer. But as we also know, the sensitivity for ICD coding was very low. So you, you cannot rely on ICD coding if you want to get a proper view of the sepsis in incidence. And we also looked at antimicrobial resistant pathogens and actually they were the cause of sepsis in 3.5% of all sepsis cases, which is quite low. Uh, but we know that we have a relatively low uh, a a AMR abundance in Sweden, but how the situation is in other countries, we don't know. So we believe that the EUSEP study can be su successful. Uh, it's possible to base it on ICD codes, but you need the manual chart re reviews, which is a little bit labor intensive and uh, also costs a li little money, of course. And we think it's important that we have used uh, common definitions of in infections and also a uh, somewhat adapted way of uh, evaluating organ, organ dysfunction since the most of the patients are outside the ICU. So a change is possible. We, the public awareness has increased uh, in six years from 20% to 50% in Sweden. We have uh, implemented or are implemented sepsis alerts and uh, post-sepsis clinics in the whole of Sweden. And regarding the sepsis incidence and the impact of A, AMR, we see that uh, sepsis is a common dis disease. One in 20 hospitalized pa patients have sepsis, and we, at least in Sweden, know that uh, the, the rate of a AMR is relatively low at the mo moment, but still it's 3-4% of all se sepsis cases, which, which is quite a, a, lot of, a high number of uh, actual patients. So, 
On, on a European level, I think that we need data and surveillance on the sepsis in incidents in your, Europe, and this uh, EUSEP pilot showed that it's possible to use ICD coding if you also add on clinical chart rev, uh, rev, reviews ma man manually. So we propose that we could use, try and use this method to, to calculate and possibly over time survey the sepsis incidence and the impact of AMR on sepsis in Europe. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Adam, for sharing with us this very interesting data. And this is a clear example of best practice and how can uh, then uh, transfer this, uh, this, uh, this study and your work into the other member states across Europe. So uh, it's been really a learning experience, not only for me, but I guess for, for also the, the audience here, for the all-in audience, uh, to learn about your, uh, your work and, and strategy as well. And also for uh, thanks for giving this positive message that a change is feasible and as also outlined by the, the commissioner uh, Stella Kirakides, indeed we're stronger together so we should intensify basically collaboration and, and actions uh, um, uh, to fight sepsis. And, and now um, we will hear um, also a very uh, interesting uh, example from, from Germany. Uh, Dr. Christian Scheer uh, will provide us uh, with a clear picture of the quality of sepsis care in Europe. Uh, I'm aware that uh, you, would have, you should have been here with us today, uh, Dr. Christians, but thanks for, for joining us also remotely for your time. So uh, Dr. Christian Scheer is the executive senior consultant at the Department of Anesthesiology and Intensive Care Medicines at the University of Medicines Greifswald in Germany. He is specialized in anesthesiology, intensive care medicines, and emergency medicines. Since 2012, his research has been focused on sepsis and quality improvement. Uh, uh, Christian is also a member of the Quality Improvement Project Sepsis Dialogue at the University of Medicines Greifswald, which also got an award in 2017 with the Global Sepsis um, um, Award, and uh, is also principal investigator of the European Sepsis Care Survey Project, of which uh, we will share um, initial results now. So I'm really looking for, uh, forward to, to hearing your presentations and your interesting inputs for, for today this discussion. The floor is yours. Thanks, Christian. Thank you very much. Uh, dear Commissioner Kiriakides, uh, dear colleagues, yeah, thank you very much for the invitation, uh, for the kind introduction, and yeah, thank you very much for the opportunity to take part today in this meeting. Today, my talk is about the European Sepsis Care Survey and I want to start with a little bit of uh, background, very brief, uh, and why there was a need for this project. In the second part uh, of my talk, I will present some of the results of the European Sepsis Care Survey. Yeah, in this first slide, you see since many years, we have international published guidelines for the management of sepsis, and you can see uh, here that we have these guidelines since two 2004, and they were updated every four years. And the content of these guidelines are evidence-based recommendations for early recognition and management of sepsis. These guidelines are about diagnostic elements like blood cultures and seropodic measures like the beginning of anti-infectives and uh, fluid resuscitation. And most or, or many of you are uh, uh, clinicians uh, in, in the audience and, and all of, of you know that these measures are very important um, for our patients and for a successful treatment of patients with sepsis. And since, year, uh, since 10 years, uh, there's also a call uh, for improvement programs um, in the guidelines, but I will come uh, back later to this in my talk again. 
Uh, next slide, please. This is a already shown a WHA resolution from 2017 on improving the prevention, diagnosis, and management of sepsis. And implemented standards and guidelines, infrastructure, laboratory capacities, strategies, and tools for, for identifying sepsis are very clearly mentioned in this resolution. And in the last years, we had ambitious initiatives to improve sepsis care in some countries. But if you know all these papers, resolutions, and recommendations, there is a very uh, important question. Do we know the status of implementation of these guidelines and standards? Next uh, slide, please. The question is, do we have sufficient and implemented standards, guidelines, and infrastructure within our hospitals? The answer on this question is, we do not know. We have no data on this topic and no structured analysis, neither for individual countries nor for the European Union. Next slide, please. To get data on this topic, we designed the European Sepsis Care Survey, which is a multidisciplinary cross-sectional analysis of structure and capabilities of sepsis care in hospitals in the European Union and worldwide. The, U the European Sepsis Care Survey has five parts, a first general part and then three parts about sepsis care in the emergency department, at the wards and at the ICUs and a last part about quality programs. The survey has altogether 94 questions, and the content are questions about capabilities, resources, recognition, screening, guidelines, protocols, diagnostic capabilities, and uh, implementation of education or training programs, quality programs for sepsis. On average, the processing of this survey took one hour and 20 minutes. So this was very comprehensive. Next slide, please. And the survey was designed and tested by a steering committee from, from the ESA uh, study group. And in a second step, um, the survey was uh, reviewed uh, by scientific boards of three uh, um, European societies, ESAIC, ESICAM, and the Intensive Care Society of UK. Um, after this, multiple national coordinators tested the questionnaire, and the survey was available in English, but also in some other languages. For participation, um, all uh, participants were asked to do a web-based re registration. And um, so this was uh, required to avoid multiple participation. And in the second part, they participated also web-based. Next slide, please. This is a picture from the recruitment in the past year. Uh, you can see hospitals worldwide participated in this project. The hospitals are the blue dots. And you can see that there was, for example, also a, a significant recruitment in India, but most of the hospitals and participants are from Europe and uh, especially from the European Union. You see that we were able to recruit um, uh, that we were able to uh, achieve a, a very distributed um, recruitment in many countries and regions. In this way, we were able to recruit in Northern, Eastern, Southern, and Western Europe, and uh, all, all these regions are uh, equally represented. Next slide. This figure shows uh, participated countries of, of the project the number of participated hospitals and the number of beds of the participating hospitals. Um, you see the blue bars, the, the dark blue bars are for the European Union and the light blue bars for other countries. 
and the bars are showing the um, proportion of represented uh, care beds for each country. And this was calculated based on Eurostat data. For example, the first bar is Croatia. And uh, here we were able to recruit 23 hospitals, which represents 90% uh, of all beds in Croatia. So Croatia participated with 90%. In total, we had participants from 60 countries, uh, 25 in the European Union. In total, we included more than 1,000 hospitals in our analysis. Regarding the EU, and this is uh, very important, we were able to achieve a sample uh, representing, representing almost 25% of all beds in the, in the European Union. Next slide. Yeah, this picture uh, shows the participants and you can see on the on the left side that most of the participants were uh, hospital directors head of departments the the red uh, proportion are the head of departments and consultants um, from the hospitals so uh, the participants were on a very high level from the hospitals and on the left side you see the uh, proportion of uh, of the different hospital sizes and um, of, the, uh, of the kind of, of hospitals which participated uh, in the survey. So you can see uh, most of the participants were from uh, small and middle-sized hospitals and most hospitals were uh, general hospitals, but also a significant, significant number of hospitals uh, like university hospitals, teaching hospitals. Next slide. Today we have uh, not so much time and I have already mentioned uh, 94 questions. So we have not much time to discuss, to discuss all the results, uh, but I will focus um, a little bit on uh, yeah, important aspects like re uh, sepsis recognition, treatment bundles, um, the availability of laboratories, and uh, in the last part on, on quality improvement programs. Next slide. Sepsis recognition yeah, is a, the first part in, in, in sepsis treatment. It is very important uh, that we identify patients very early. And so screening is, is, is one measure to do this. And in the, in the guidelines, this is the first part, the first very important uh, recommendation. And if you Google sepsis screening, you find many uh, examples for, for protocols um, or checklists to, to uh, identify sepsis and to screen for sepsis. So this was a question if hospitals do this, if they screen for sepsis, and this was the first question and the first result I like to present. Next slide. So the question was, do you have a protocol or standardized uh, screening tool, especially for the recognition of sepsis? And you see the answers from the hospitals. The hospitals here are shown uh, for the different, uh, different hospital sizes. On the left side, small hospitals from zero to uh, 250 beds. And on the left side, large hospitals with more than 1,000 beds. And you see the results for the emergency department. These are the lined bars. The light grays are the results for, for, the, for the wards. And the dark gray bars uh, are the results for the, for the um, ICUs. And you see that not all hospitals uh, use screening and do this. Uh, next slide. You see that in all uh, hospital sizes, small hospitals and also large hospitals, there is a, a, a lot of room for improvement. And um, yes, um, in, the, in the emergency department, uh, most mostly at the wards, there is uh, uh, not very much screening established and uh, the ICUs are a little bit better 
but they are also um, yeah, uh, they are also lacking. Next slide. So the next uh, the, yeah, the next question is um, if the hospitals uh, use protocols bundles for example uh, or other pathways and the sepsis bundle is a is a very uh, simple procedure. It is. Uh, about uh, taking blood cultures, uh, do fluid resuscitation, and to start anti-infectives. So this is uh, not very complex, and you find in the internet also uh, much more difficult uh, uh, protocols. But we just ask, do you have such a simple bundle or something else, uh, another protocol? And uh, next slide. Here you can see the re results again for the um, uh, five sizes of hospitals, uh, again for the emergency department, for the ward, and for the ICU. And you can, can see that also for this very basic uh, uh, measure for the bundle, that there, uh, that there is a lot of room for improvement. Uh, there are a high number of hospitals in Europe and all the results which I present today are only for the uh, European Union. Um, in, in all these hospitals, there are uh, uh, too much uh, um, emergency departments, too much wards and too much ICUs, which have no bundle, no pathway or, or, nothing, uh, or, or anything else like that. Um, next slide. And in red, you see here again, uh, the room for, for improvement. Next slide. Um, rapid pathogen uh, identification is very important, important uh, uh, for sepsis treatment. So for this, we need uh, microbiological uh, laboratories and uh, they should be 24 seven open. And we analyzed um, if hospitals have uh, these labs and if they are open uh, 24 seven. Next slide. And here you can see most of the hospitals, they have uh, microbiological labs, but the labs are not open. They had li very limited working hours and uh, only in a proportion of uh, 10 to 20%, they have labs which are working um, 24 seven. And now is the question, is this a problem if the, if the um, laboratories are not open? And uh, next slide. And we have, we have asked, um, asked the, the, um, the personnel, how is the, is the time from taking the blood cultures to the first result and the second result? Next um, slide. Here you can see the, the time uh, to the first result from the laboratory and to the, to the second uh, or to the final result. And you can see here the, uh, um, the darker um, bars showing a higher proportion and uh, earlier, uh, the earlier um, uh, um, uh, notification of the results. So it is important and you see that this has an impact um, on, on the uh, results. Next slide. So the last uh, aspect is a quality improvement and uh, yeah, quality improvement is education, it is uh, feedback, um, it is also the measuring of uh, quality parameters. And the, there is since 10 years a call uh, in the guidelines to do uh, such quality improvement in initiatives and um, yeah in the in the guideline from 2012 uh, there was written that the committee hopes that over time there will be an improvement um, and next slide and we all know that these uh, initiatives uh, can be very successful. We had the data and, and studies in the, in the last year. So there is no question about uh, quality improvement programs. Next slide. But here you can see 
how quality improvement programs are established in European uh, hospitals. So the rate is very, very low. Um, and for this important uh, thing, there is also a, a lot of improvement. Next slide. Okay, next slide. Um, up to now, I have only uh, show, shown um, results for, for the different hospital sizes. But on this slide, I will show you that there are also very interesting differences between the countries. And you see here uh, in these pictures, again, the sepsis screening and uh, other things. And you see that there is a, a wide range uh, many differences uh, between uh, the countries and that that countries have different uh, problems and uh, they they are not all on on the same level the countries in in this uh, figure are uh, blinded next slide and also for for example for antibiotic stewardship or things like that you see that there is a wide range of variation. And you see that there are some hospitals and countries uh, which are on a high level, almost uh, 100%. So in these countries, guidelines in the hospitals are established. And you see that there are other countries where uh, guidelines, for example, for antimicrobial uh, treatment are not uh, established and not common. Next slide. So we have many more uh, results in, I, in, in, in our uh, survey, but I cannot present these today. Next slide. But before I come to my conclusion, I would like to take the opportunity to thank the more than 1,500 participants. I would like to thank the steering committee uh, yeah, for supporting and uh, for uh, giving in, in input to this project and also the national coordinators who, uh, who did a great job. And I would like to thank the, the societies which in, endorsed, in, endorsed the, the project. Next slide. So this is my conclusion in the end. Yeah, what, what can we say uh, in the end? We have a large and well dis distributed sample representing almost 25% of all beds in the European Union. But uh, this sample could be a positive selection in the end because we recruited by uh, on, the, on, the, on the platforms of the societies and we don't know uh, what is in the other 75% uh, of the hospitals. Essential and uh, recommended uh, basic measures and structures are very often insufficient. And uh, we observed differences between the countries. Uh, differentiated uh, improvement approaches can be drawn up uh, for individual countries. So this could be a result of, of this project. And altogether, there is a lot of space for improve, improvement. Uh, in future, audits could be an instrument to measure sepsis quality and care and status of implementation in the hospitals uh, in, in Europe and also worldwide. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Christian. Thank you so much. This is a really a tremendous work, and thanks for having shared with us uh, this uh, very comprehensive picture, and also for, for having shared uh, many important high-level recommendations, including screening, um, training, and education, as well of healthcare professionals, uh, uh, early uh, identification, recognition, but also protocols, programs that are all uh, very important elements in the treatment of sepsis. Uh, 
And if I may ask to, to you, but also to our colleagues, Adam Linder here, um, because we have been mentioning a lot of data uh, surveillance, data gathering, so what's the challenge in, in your views to implement sepsis clinical uh, guidelines uh, um, more in a more harmonized approach across Europe. Um, can you give also a, um, a personal um, uh, opinion coming from Sweden and Germany? I think the, the challenge is that we have really an implementation, not only discussions uh, on, on meetings, um, we, we need to implement uh, these guidelines really in the hospital and we have to control this. I think audits could be, could be a, a, a measure to do this, but uh, we have to control the quality, we have to control the standards because we need these standards. They are important for, for the patient with sepsis and for the success. So um, yeah, I think it's, it's really time to act and uh, to establish the guidelines, not in, in, in some uh, hospitals which are specialized for sepsis studies and uh, doing things like that. We, we have to implement the standards in every hospital, small, small sized hospitals and also larger hospitals. The problems are in, in, in all uh, kind of hospitals and university hospitals are not better than, than smaller hospitals. So this is a result of, of the project. And yeah, we have to go to the hospitals and uh, we have to implement uh, these guidelines uh, now. Since, uh, since 20 years, we are talking about um, how we can treat patients with sepsis, but uh, now it's really time to do this. Absolutely. Thank you, uh, Dr. Christian. Perhaps I'm just uh, before giving the floor to uh, Professor Adam, I'm collecting also a questions from the online audience. So when it comes to uh, sepsis education uh, for nurses and in, in medical study, what's the situation, the current situation in, in Germany? Yeah, I, I had in the end, I, I showed you the, the country data. And we are in, in Germany, we are not very good. We are in the end um, of, the, of the benchmark and uh, sepsis screening in, in Germany is not uh, established in, in most of the hospitals. So we have a problem in Germany. We have initiatives and they started in, uh, in the last years and we have to see uh, how the implementation and, and the education goes on. But uh, in 2021, these are the results. We are very bad in Germany in terms of screening, in terms of uh, protocols. Our labs in Germany are not open. Uh, we have a high proportion, and, and I do not show this, a high proportion of external uh, laboratories, so uh, uh, samples, have to be transported to the to the laboratories, and this take much time. And diagnosis and pathogen identification is is delayed. So we have a lot of uh, problems, and we we have to start, I think, with a very simple actions like the screening and and the bundles, for example. They have to be established in the hospitals. Thank you. Adam, how is it difficult to, to implement uh, sepsis clinical guidelines in, in, at the hospital level in Sweden? Yeah, yeah. Uh, how difficult? We, we don't know. We, we're not, we have not done it all, uh, but I think the, the, the key is that we need proper data so that we understand the problem uh, and uh, then we need some kind of a so solution and in luckily in Sweden the gov government has uh, acknowledged this and uh, also al allocated uh, funds so uh, I'm actually quite positive that we will have a, a like a standardized protocol for this in Sweden within a year uh, but then the next thing is also will this help 
uh, will it improve the care and will that improve outcome or and we, will we, I mean, uh, in, in the end we hope that it will uh, improve outcome, it will help patients but also save us money in a bit because sepsis care is very expensive. But that we, we don't know, but it's a continuous effort and we have to work together to, uh, and I think, I mean, it's a, like we discussed yesterday at the di di dinner, there is a lot of low hanging fruits in sepsis care and man management. So it's a quite positive uh, area to de deal with because it has not, not so much has happened and there's a lot of things that we can do with quite small mes measures. So mm -hmm. I'm looking for a bright future. Me too. <laughs> Me too. Thanks, um, Adam. Um, thank you very much uh, again, uh, Christian and Adam, for, for having shared your, your insights. And now it's time to um, give the floor and to, to welcome on the stage uh, Teresa um, uh, Zauer. Uh, Teresa is um, a sepsis survivor from, from the Czech Republic. She survived a sepsis shock back in, in March after contracting a bacterial sepsis caused by Campylobacter that was in the, uh, in the chicken she, she cooked at home. Teresa is a very sporty, a very fit woman, and she did not know that sepsis could have had such a strong impact on her, on her daily life. And she's now committed to raise awareness about sepsis in her countries, but also to share her personal testimonial with, with us and with all the also online audience. Um, and uh, we are really grateful, uh, Teresa, for, for, for your time, and, and we are really looking forward to, to hear your story, which is a great fantastic example of uh, why awareness, uh, prevention, early identification uh, are really critical success factor in, uh, in solving this major patient safety issue. So, Teresa, the floor is yours. I welcome you on the floor, if that's okay. Hello. <laughs> I'm sorry for my nervous. It's my first time. And uh, I hope it doesn't matter if I can read my notes uh, because uh, my memory is not very good. And <sighs> sorry. Excuse us for, for this uh, short break, but um, I think that uh, you know it's the first time that Teresa speaks uh, in, in in public, so I I feel a little bit the, the, the emotions and also the adrenaline. So um, I think that Teresa will read uh, a little bit uh, her her intervention. For us, of course, it's not a problem, and I absolutely reassure that we are totally fine and uh, there is no uh, pressure at all. So whenever you are ready. Um, I'll hand you the floor. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. Thank you for your patience. <laughs> so, oh, just a moment. <laughs> okay. So, I'm Teresa, and my life was completely changed by septic shock from common infection caused by Campylobacter. Funny is, I didn't eat the chicken, but I worked with it. I prepared the raw chicken for the soup, and the infection hit my body through the hangnail. This time, I was in Bali, a few days before my journey back to the Czech Republic. I was a healthy and well-trained person, fitness coach, nutrition coach, and traveler, and I never expected I lost all of this in a few days in ICU. So, the septic shock. Day after arrival, I felt bad. I had fever and chills, and it took three days. I thought it was post-COVID syndrome because I had COVID-19 a few weeks ago. Many people around me had the same symptoms. Of course, I didn't realize it could be sepsis because I knew sepsis attacks mainly elderly people, children, 
people with weak immune system or after some big injuries or surgeries. I knew something was wrong third day in the evening. It was Wednesday when I lost consciousness and my parents called the ambulance. It was the first trip to the emergency where they gave me paracetamol and told me your blood results are not so bad. It's some intestines infection and recommended me another blood test on Friday. And they sent me back home at 2 a.m. from the hospital. The day after the worst, uh, the day after was the worst I've ever had. On Friday morning, I felt exhausted, I couldn't speak, and I wasn't able to woke up from the bed, so I couldn't go to the hospital for the blood test, and a nurse came to my home. The results were in one hour, and the doctor called ambulance immediately because I was in the septic shock. It was less than 30 hours since first trip to the emergency where they didn't recognize something could be wrong. CRP, CRP level was 430, blood pressure 70 to 40. My kidneys, lungs, intestines, and heart started to fail. I spent eight days in ICU. The antibiotics stopped working and CRP level started to grow again. So the doctors decided for surgery, and this surgery saved my life. Uh, my belly, my stomach, intestines, were full of infected green liquid, which they pumped out from my stomach first day on ICU. It was around one and a half liter. Now it was everywhere. I spent another 10 days in the hospital and finally sent home. And I learned from my mom I survived the septic shock because my mom told me she is a dentist and she knew that I had 10% to survive. Nobody in the hospital told me it could be sepsis. So the word sepsis wasn't communicated with me. And now post-sepsis experience. It's very hard for me because I learned walk again and it was very frustrating for me like for fitness coach. I was very determined to get back in life soon. So I started with yoga, walks and cold therapy again. Some days are a little bit better, but most of the time I felt sad, frustrated, exhausted, tired, and very often I didn't see the light in this darkness. The biggest support uh, were my parents, and I'm here like I am because of their care. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. So now I have horrible problems with my memory, and very often I can find the right words while I'm speaking. This is the reason why I need notes, but it d didn't help me. <laughs> uh, I have horrible hair loss. I lost almost 80% of my hair. I had changed taste, nightmares, joint pain, and headache. Like I, I have never had. And of course, PTSD is welcome. <laughs> so these past six months, oh my God, these past six months have been the hardest of my life. So I told myself, challenge accepted. <laughs> after this experience with sepsis, I found out that in my country there isn't aftercare for survivors. Sorry. It's very difficult to explain people around how, uh, how hard life after sepsis with PTSD is. And mo of, most of them don't know how they can support us. All the time I hear, you have to forget it or you'll be okay. 
If you don't know anything about sepsis, this phrase feels like you're minimizing the traumatic experience I went and still going through. These side effects are harder than burpees. <laughs> I hope that my story can help to make bigger changes in the healthcare system take the patient seriously and make clear communication between doctors and patients. So this is very serious and every minute counts. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's like Thank me. you. <laughs> Thank you so much, uh, Teresa. I mean, your story has been absolutely, well, quite touching, in my opinion, very moving, but also very important to today, uh, for today's discussion. You have been absolutely very strong, and thanks also for you know, being so brave in, in sharing um, your personal story with us. Uh, thank you so much, really, on behalf of everybody here, but especially from, uh, on behalf of the, the European Sepsis Alliance. Thank you so much. Thank yeah. you for your patience. Yeah. If I just may ask a very small question, uh, do you believe uh, you have received enough uh, support and also you are still re if you are still receiving enough support from the, the Czech Republic health uh, systems in your rehabilitation? No. Uh, just, just from my parents and friends and, and from Global Sepsis Alliance, but not from anybody from Czech Republic. Instead of one doctor from... Uh, from one hospital in Prague. Okay. It's very sad. It is, but uh, this is why we're here today, try to, to make a, a positive change, right? And uh, really to um, boost a little bit the, the actions, not only at EU level, global level, but also especially at the national level, right? And to support uh, patients and because patient, the patient's voice is really uh, key, it's really central in fully implement then the, the national uh, strategy on sepsis at, at the country level. So again, Thank you so much, Teresa, for, for having shared your story. It has been a really, really an honor having you uh, here with us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Of course. And, and now I, I think that I, uh, it's time to, to welcome the, the other panelists of this uh, second panel session. Um, Professor Jean-Marc uh, Cavillon, uh, if, you, if you can join me on, on the stage here, thank you. I'm aware that uh, the, the patient uh, voice has a growing role in, in France, which is at the forefront of uh, the fight against sepsis. So thank you very much for, for being with us and for also for sharing further reflections on, uh, on the implementation um, and the, 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 the great example that France is in the, in the fight against uh, sepsis. Uh, professor uh, Jean-Marc Cavillon uh, is a honorary professor of Institut Pasteur in France. He has been also head of the research unit uh, um, uh, and inflammation uh, and director of the department infections and epidemiology. He has been president of the International uh, Endotoxin and Innate Immunity Society and also president of the European Shock Society from 2016 to 2018. He has an extensive expertise on inflammation, sepsis and septic shock. He has been also very much involved in transnational research, studying uh, the immune status of patients with sepsis and other severe inflammatory disorders. And is currently scientific officer at the French National Research Agency uh, in charge of the, the COVID-19 pandemic, but also on uh, antimicrobial resistance. So, the floor is yours. Thank you, Professor. 
Well, um, I, I thought, in fact, uh, first I'm happy and uh, thank the Sepsis Highlands for inviting me. Uh, I did not realize that I had to give a talk. I thought it was just an, a panel and a discussion with some questions. So I have not prepared anything, in fact. Uh, so first, I would like to thank Teresa for her testimony. I mean, it's exactly what we do need and the public need is to know that first you can survive. I mean, it's often sepsis is presented as a deadly and we speak in terms of dead people and we count them. But in fact, they are survivors and they will leave and their uh, way of life will be totally modified and changed. And this is clearly something that has to be known from the public that you can survive. <coughs> but then sometimes with difficulties. And for that, we do need association from patients because they will also carry the message to the um, national authorities. And in France, we were, if I can say that, lucky that one mother who uh, lost her son because of peritonitis and sepsis shock, she has created what is called now the France Sepsis uh, Association, which uh, work hard to uh, favor the um, knowledge of the, uh, of the disease around, um, uh, around France. And uh, because she's from origin, her is from Morocco, next month she will make an organize a webinar exactly to inform the American, Moroccan uh, physicians about sepsis. So I think we, it, those people are very important to uh, improve the, the fact that our uh, authorities will realize that how sepsis is important. The uh, second topic I'd like to address is research. I mean, of course, sepsis is a disease of human beings, but also it is associated with research. And I don't know in your different countries, in Sweden, Germany, or Czech Republic, wherever, uh, how the funding of research is organized. Uh, clearly, in France, we have a problem. If a problem is that there is the funding for fundamental research, a funding for clinical research. But sepsis is just a translational research. It's joining fundamental research with clinical research. And often you heard from the, from the physician, they say, well, we have a great program. We want to include patients and we want to study in vitro, on cells, on animal models, what's going on. And then the, the, the people in charge of the clinical research will say, this is not our job. We are not funding that. And the same, the reverse for those who are just funding the um, fundamental research. So I think, and again, if you have that kind of, of funding in your countries, it will be terrific, but it's really what we miss in France is to have a way to fund research that is joining the fundamental research and the clinical research and the epidemiological research and, and the social, uh, <coughs> human social uh, research. So this is also what we need to, to support for uh, further understanding and uh, I'm a scientist and I've been working on sepsis for 30 years before retiring. And my testimony, my uh, last paper was after that, it's 30 years of failure despite efficient research. I mean, we have saved thousands of mice. Thousands of mice have been saved and allowing the researcher to have great papers in great journals thousands of mice, not one human for the last 30 years have been saved thanks to new therapeutical approaches. So we really need to better understand, to think that we need to change the paradigm of research. For example, I'm supporting, instead of putting an artificial murine model, mouse don't make fever when they are infected. So how do you want to study sepsis in an animal which don't make fever when you inject bugs. And this is because, in fact, mice thermoneutrality is 30 degrees. And you 
and all mice, and you are asked by the ethical committee in charge of the animals that you have to keep your mice at 20 degrees. But at 20 degrees, the mice are freezing. It's like if we were sit sitting here since the beginning at 10 degrees. We'll be like the mice in the cage, getting closer to get warmer. So this is just an example how the, the animal model may not fully be appropriate. And I support, for example, that we work with veterinarian because they do have animals that make sepsis. For example, horses and, uh, do uh, uh, spontaneous sepsis. And it's interesting to have those kind of, and it's, in addition, you can have money because sometimes the owners of, of the horses are ready to pay for, to save their, of their very expensive horse. So we, we need completely to think in other ways our research is made to find a better approach. And I, I would like to, to just to end with quoting a, a Norwegian infectiologue who said human disease should be studied in the diseased humans. And I think really we need to boost that kind of research to better understand what's going on and how can we deal and offer a new therapeutic approach, new diagnosis approach for, for sepsis. I apologize because I, honestly I was not aware that there was something to prepare. Thank you very much, Professor. Thank you for uh, this uh, very interesting um, uh, intervention that you share, also especially emphasizing the, the role of research uh, in today's debate. I would also like to welcome now uh, the other panelists, uh, Madame Madine Grappe, is ambassador on AMR from Sweden, but also uh, Sabine Kosebau from the permanent representation of Germany to the EU, who is uh, kindly hosting us today. And perhaps I just have a, a, a small question um, for Professor Cavillon. So after having listened to, to Teresa's story, um, what do you think went, went wrong, you know, and in a ideal world with the, right, with the right processes, what should have happened in, in your views? We need to realize that sepsis are not just numbers, and there are people behind that. And uh, I think it's important to listen to them. And also, I mean, we realize, I mean, people are just rediscovering the post-COVID symptoms. And now it looks like it's a new disease. I mean, people post-COVID who had severe COVID. But in fact, if you inter uh, interact and with this, uh, Teresa, the most uh, information was clear that since uh, sepsis exists, the post-sepsis syndrome also existed. And that we are just rediscovering thanks to COVID. And in fact, I think we can be grateful for COVID-19 because it's bringing back to um, the top of the interaction with the public the sepsis, COVID-19, the severe form of COVID-19 are viral sepsis. We are used and we heard about bacterial sepsis, but this is the same story. It's not the same bug, but the, the body is reacting the same way. It's localized within the lungs. In often bacterial sepsis is associated also with pneumonia and most of the sepsis start from the lungs. So, I mean, this is just increasing knowledge is an in, in input for uh, research and for studying patients also with, with COVID-19. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. And, and now I'm really pleased uh, to, to hand the floor uh, to Malin Grappe. Uh, she's ambassador on antimicrobial resistance uh, in Sweden. Um, Malin um, Grape, um, doctor, is an ambassador and since March 2022, in her previous position as deputy head of the Department for Communicable Disease Control and Health Protection and head of unit for antibiotics and infection control at the Public Health Agency uh, of Sweden, she has been responsible for national coordination and international cooperation on AMR and healthcare-associated infections. 
Dr. Grappe is also a licensed pharmacist and holds a PhD in medical science from the Karolinska Institute uh, in Sweden. So it's a real honor to, to have you here and we're really looking forward also to, to, um, to listen to your um, observations, reflections on how we can work together um, to, um, in the fight against sepsis and, and, and therefore save lives. Thank you so much, um, and same with me, actually. <laughs> Didn't prepare a like, starting intervention, but let me reflect a little bit. Um, first of all, I want to thank you for a really nicely organized event and, and program. It's been, uh, it's been really interesting to, to listen to, to all the previous speakers, and especially I'm overwhelmed by the generosity of, of Theresa for sharing her story, and I think this is so important as, as you already touched upon it's it's by sharing and 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 really getting people behind these words that we can improve and and um, increase both awareness but also uh, engagement uh, and this I think is is um, because, you know, I'm, I'm working with AMR uh, and sepsis and AMR are linked. They're not the same thing. Uh, there are parallels. And when it comes to awareness, knowledge um, and, and uh, engagement, I think there is a lot uh, in common between these two phenomena, if you may say so. Um, because it's, I mean, sepsis could be caused by different pathogens, obviously. AMR, again, it's, it's a, you know, it's a group of, of different infections, it's different diseases, it's, it's even different kinds of drugs to which these microbes develop resistance. So it becomes very vague. Um, and, and this is, of course, a problem for, for actually getting people to, to feel that this is something we have to deal with. Um, so, so this is something that we also in, in, in my, you know, the AMR world are, are talking a lot about how to, to increase awareness and engagement. Not only awareness, because that's not enough as long as you don't actually act on this awareness. Uh, so, so I'm really grateful for the intervention of Theresa today. Um, as I said, AMR and, and sepsis are linked. Um, first of all, sepsis is, is, I mean, one of those really severe acute um, cases where, for which we need to save antibiotics to be working. This is the reason for, for AMR being such a huge problem, uh, because these drugs are, are actually aimed to save lives, as in cases with sepsis, or prevent lifelong disabilities. Um, but you may also reflect a little bit on, on the need for antibiotics also in the earlier stages. Um, because an, a more, you know, less severe or acute infection, if not appropriately treated or if actually treatment fails, may result in a sepsis. It may develop and result in a severe sepsis. So, so you may also call sepsis a, you kind of an, you know, the, the ultimate consequence of, of resistance. It's not like every uh, infection without you know, correct treatment develops into sepsis, but it's, it's, a, it's a risk. Uh, so this is where I think it's, it's, it's very important. I'm very glad to be here today to, to make these uh, the links. Um, then again, Sepsis and AMR may partly be prevented in the same ways we need to prevent infections, first of all, um, before even talking about the appropriate uh, treatment. And I think this is also something that is, um, I mean, there's a higher awareness obviously now um, with the pandemic experience with us, um, but it's, it's really important to, to keep this in mind and, and to keep the awareness of, of uh, prevention of infections from the beginning. Uh, and that means, of course, uh, and especially maybe when it comes to sepsis, but, but also for AMR in general, um, immunization. We need, we need vaccines and we need people to take them. 
So that's one part of it. But also, and um, that goes very much for AMR, I must say, and, and partly for sepsis, infection control in hospitals. Commissioner Kyriakidis touched upon the, the um, healthcare-associated infections. Now we know that, that the majority of, of sepsis cases are actually community-acquired, uh, but the ones uh, that are healthcare-associated should, of course, be prevented and minimized to you know, the extent that is possible. I think no, and I guess you all agree with me, no patient in a hospital should get an infection due to uh, spread of microbes within the hospitals due to, I mean, non-adherence to, to, uh, to prevention guidelines, to hand washing, to, to all the, the support there is in a hospital for preventing spread of disease. Uh, so I think this is, this is also important for, for both these areas. When it comes to management, obviously there is, there is a, a different way of managing AMR as a whole and, and managing sepsis. But, but again, I think there's a lot to, to learn from what is being done. Um, Adam touched upon the, um, the experiences from Sweden now where a national clinical pathway has been developed and being implemented now. Uh, and I think this is also, uh, it's a good example because sometimes we tend to, and that goes definitely also for IPC, uh, we tend to uh, look a lot at guidelines, but when it comes to implementation and follow-up, we might not be that good. So this is also going to be very interesting to see uh, how implementation in, of this pathway is being follow-up. So uh, let me stop there and, and we may continue the discussion. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Um, Grappe, especially for having highlighted the, this uh, correlation right, between, between sepsis and, and uh, AMR. Indeed, we have come across a sort of a disparity in the respective responses uh, um, to, to these challenges, both uh, sepsis and AMR, uh, although they are uh, sort of interlinked. So thanks also for applying the, the lessons from the AMR debate into the sepsis one as well. And now, because we have heard a lot from the national um, representatives, it's also time to um, uh, to further discuss what can be done uh, at EU level. And now I'm really um, uh, delighted to to welcome uh, Mr. Sabine um, Kosebau uh, from the, the permanent representations um, of Germany to the EU. She has an extensive um, uh, experience on, on healthcare, also including pharmaceuticals, before joining um, um, the, the perm rep here in, in Brussels. Uh, she has been uh, working uh, as a special advisor to the uh, Secretary of State uh, at the Ministry of Health, uh, and now she's currently leading the um, the, the health department of the permanent representation of Germany. So thank you very much also, especially for hosting us uh, within your premises. Um, how we can um, essentially generate more awareness, also political focus uh, among European policymakers, you believe, when it comes to, to, to sepsis and, and all the critical solutions to fight it? Yes, um, thank you. And uh, we're actually very, very glad to host all of you here because you're doing a very, very important work in all of your um, awareness rising and also research work and, and, and the groundwork that is needed to um, um, keep people um, healthy and uh, also um, help them after they have been uh, through such a thing um, keep them getting there again hopefully to get healthy and not uh, suffer um, more and I also have to say I, I cannot say exactly um, uh, that I would say um, on a European level but for me it's rather a multifaceted approach um, uh, everybody is affected um, I was also listening uh, very closely to what uh, Teresa said and I was reminded that 25 years ago um, my father was deathly ill 
I would say, in a hospital uh, after a heart attack. And he had two very close uh, scares to sepsis. And um, uh, he is now a very happy 91-year-old and has uh, no further consequences. Um, so uh, for me, it's also uh, not only seeing the patients, but also the other ones are affected around the patients as well and everybody around. Um, so, as uh, the German uh, uh, representative uh, in this panel, I have to say uh, for sure I heard what the colleague uh, uh, or the professor from the University of uh, Greifswald, I think he was a professor, uh, said uh, about uh, Germany also having to do uh, the homework uh, in the practical implementation in the hospitals uh, to prevent uh, sepsis. And uh, um, I have to say, for us, it is actually a big focus to um, prevent sepsis and uh, to raise awareness. Uh, so we're very happy that uh, the German government, uh, since July 2021, uh, has been sponsoring a, a very a big campaign uh, to raise awareness uh, of sepsis, uh, which has been done by uh, the German Sepsis Foundation, the German Sepsis Help, uh, Sepsis uh, Dialogue, uh, just to name a few in the University of Greifswald, and which is also um, a topic that we also focused in the G7 health presidency that we have uh, um, this year, um, uh, where we put into the declaration that there should be a focus on addressing uh, sepsis and everything including with sepsis. So um, what we see, it's a, a multifaceted approach that is needed, that we start with the research, then we look at the guidelines. Uh, in Germany, we have at the Robert Koch Institute, our public health institute, a commission that is focusing on uh, hospital hygiene and infectious disease preventions. Uh, but these are, again, the guidelines that then need to be implemented actually in reality. So it is also a very important part to raise the awareness uh, which is being done in Germany in the campaign uh, to educate not only patients, but also ordinary citizens uh, to be aware if there is an oncoming sepsis, to know what to do, and also then, most of all, the practitioners, that something like this will not happen um, so often with Teresa, where um, the practitioners themselves didn't see the sign uh, at first correctly, if I understood uh, your story. So this is very important, and uh, we look very much forward to doing uh, work not only a, on a national level and a European level and also at the international level. And uh, if I look to the European level, because you ask that of us, um, this is what the Commissioner mentioned, but I'm also seeing that with the legislative uh, work being done on the European health data space, for example, um, focusing on also accessing data for secondary use uh, research and also having more data on a primary level as well to connect the dots and have the research and then get the positive results in the, for the future. Thank you. Um, thank you, Sabine. I, we're really uh, certainly commending all this uh, great work happening at different levels of, of governance and especially for you know the G7 uh, recognizing uh, the crucial um, need to, to combat sepsis and to further raise awareness and promoting uh, um, further actions at, at, the, at the national level across Europe as well uh, when it comes to uh, sepsis prevention, diagnosis and clinical management. Uh, but before I also ask you uh, another question, so is there any questions from, from the floor here, but also from our online audience that we could ask uh, the panelists today? Yes. I kindly ask you to please introduce yourself before asking the question. Thank you. Well, Maybe it's not a question, just a brief statement beforehand. Uh, my name is Aurika Pripa, I'm chairman of the European Sepsis Alliance Working Group of, uh, we say patients, but actually sepsis survivors and family members. Uh, the working group was set up in 2019, one year later, because we've uh, uh, realized that, and I'm actually surrounded by, by sepsis survivors on my right, my, my, my husband, Teresa, Michael, maybe anyone else, but we've realized that uh, often uh, we're speaking about theoretical uh, things, sepsis, and only by uh, bringing this type of 
cases stepping out uh, that people re uh, understand that sepsis uh, uh, can affect anyone, any age, at any time, by any disease. But if we have a knowledge and if we're empowered, we can save lives of our loved ones and our family. Because what is happening is the burden is all, uh, often is on the people who survive sepsis. If they're alive, uh, they're usually amputated or have the, the long post-sepsis uh, uh, burdens. And on their family ones. Uh, if you don't receive a coffin, uh, because it happens very quickly in ICU, se sepsis is an emergency. It takes life in 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 a couple of days. But sepsis is also the most preventable cause of death, and that's why we started to speak up. So actually, what we are calling is for mandatory uh, guidelines in place in European hospitals. Mm -hmm. So my question, is that possible? You know, and Professor said that we have, we have so, many res so much research and we have uh, so many, we know the problem, but we are ready to come forward with the solutions and even share more and more and maybe to start from that at every single part of the chain, be it a GP, emergency, ICU, afterwards, that people are Caught, because everyone thinks that the European health system is sepsis proven. It is not. You can lose your loved ones uh, overnight, you know, and then regret that this you could have saved life. So uh, why don't you know starting from a couple of pilot uh, hospitals and going ahead and spreading it and being the model uh, around the world. So that's my statement and maybe uh, an open question. Thank you so much. I'd like to ask a question on more the financial side, looking at the European budgets and national budgets. We've talked about preventing sepsis, awareness, but one thing that has not been addressed much to my knowledge in different countries is the cost of revalidation of patients who have survived sepsis. Because this is a cost which I believe to be just as high, if not higher, than the actual hospital treatment costs of keeping people from dying. So what is likely the position in Europe in terms of looking at the budget requirements for post-sepsis revalidation? Thank you. Thank you very much. Is there any other question uh, from the floor? Not? If not, uh, well, um, th these are really great call to action. So perhaps, I don't know, Sa Sabine, would you like to, to respond to, to one of these comments? Uh, yes, uh, thank you very much. I cannot answer to all of them because as everything, it's a very complicated uh, issue. Um, but uh, yes, for sure, it's uh, not only um, uh, seeing um, how to prevent death, but um, reading the statistics, especially with sepsis, uh, um, the long-term survivors and, and, and the complications arising from that, and having the rehabilitation structures available. Um, this is, I think, something right now in every health system in Europe that needs to be looked at what are the rehabilitation structures. Um, I think in Germany we do have the availability of rehabilitation structures, but still, again, it's also something about something being on paper and then being put into practice and, and, and where to go and know who to approach uh, for which um, measures to be taken. But for sure, this is also in all of healthcare, I think. And this is not something specifically for sepsis, but also for other illnesses. Uh, we have this long COVID uh, situation right now where it's also said you have an intense illness, but then you're kind of recovered, but are you recovered and what are you doing with that state and how do you get care for that status? So that is something that I think all governments uh, need to look at and, and take care of uh, their citizens. Yeah. Um, first of all, let me say something about uh, the costs because um, this is not you know, my, my general area, but I think what is really important is, of course, uh, health economic 
calculations and evaluations. And, and that was actually done even though it's quite specific for, for the Swedish clinical pathway, uh, which is composed, as, as Ada mentioned, it's composed of, of um, three parts, which is uh, sepsis alert uh, for, you know, comprehensive and, and, and fast uh, management and, and uh, the second part, I will come back to that maybe, is, is the correct coding for follow-up. And then the third one is follow-up of, of patients after discharge. So this is, I mean, this is included, this is a needs-based um, pathway. The, this multidisciplinary working group actually first looked at the needs in the Swedish context. And then a health econ economic uh, analysis was done to actually, you know, prove that the prevention of these um, disabilities and, and, and long-term consequences are, there, there is a possibility of actually saving uh, resources in this way. It's going to cost a bit more with, with staff resources, for example, but in this analysis also fell out in a positive way for, for actually... Um, preventing higher cost in the later stage. So I think this is a good example. I think we need more of that. Also in the AMR area, we need more, you know, we, we need to know the cost of inaction. What's, what's it going to cost if we don't manage to, to actually deal with these issues uh, in a, you know, both comprehensive and, and effective way? So that's one part. Uh, when it comes to, to guidelines, uh, as I said, said earlier, I think guidelines are good and, and it shouldn't be impossible to actually have guidelines in all hospitals, right? But again, I think the, the trickiest part is the change of behavior. That is to, to really implement the guidelines and, and not only assure that people start following them, but also to, to maintain the adherence. And for this, I think uh, better surveillance and data is probably essential. Uh, I can uh, develop a lot on that. Yes, <laughs> certainly there is no silver bullets, but uh, a set of you know key recommendations and solutions. Perhaps, uh, Professor Cavillon, do you also want, wish to, to complement uh, uh, with your views as well? Thanks. Well, I think in terms of cost, I think this is a very good question because usually when you People are talking, physicians are talking about sepsis. They will say when a patient hospitalized for sepsis will cost 16,000 euros, but they never talk about the cost post-sepsis. And I think this is an excellent question that we should think about and epidemiological studies should be done to have an idea because it's a long, I mean, a patient hospitalized for sepsis is for a short period of time, but the patient post-sepsis, it's a long life. And if it's, there are uh, costs for that, I mean, the society has to be aware just to sensitize the politicians that if we deal with a preventable disease, we also could limit the cost of the post, uh, post I, will, I was ready to say post-COVID, because interestingly, uh, as I said, it is a, there is a major overlapping. And it, just a word about this post-COVID. I mean, at the very beginning, the physicians were not believing their patients. They were complaining, and they were not believing their patients. This is just amazing. And nowadays, I think, thanks to the COVID and all the testimony about the life after sepsis, we realize that there is another major uh, aspect that should be taken into consideration, and you're fully right. I mean, there is a cause for that, for the society, and a motivation for uh, limiting the, the, the frequency of sepsis, informing the physicians and the public. Because the story, I mean, the, the story of this lady who lost her son, she discovered sepsis afterward but she was just close to her son and describing all the symptoms and she was realizing that something wrong were going on. And she talked with the nurses and they didn't take into consideration her observation, but a normal nurse informed about sepsis would have said, well, she's right, she's not crazy, this mother. The, the nurse asked the mother to leave the room because she thought that she was had a bad influence on her son. So, I mean, clearly, 
information of the public, of the nurse, on all the public health carrier uh, people are involved in, in health at all stage should know about sepsis and taking care of sepsis, just to limit the cost. Thank you. Thank you so much for these powerful messages that you all have given us with, uh, today. I would love to discuss more, so to take more more questions, but conscious of time, um, we have also the uh, WHO representative who is joining us today uh, virtually, and we're really grateful for the continuous support of the WHO, both uh, the, the headquarters in Geneva and the regional uh, office of the WHO, and now I will hand the flow to uh, Dr. Joao Breda, who is a special advisor of the WHO Europe uh, Regional Director for the Establishment, establishment of Sub-Regional Offices and is based in Greece. Uh, until recently, he headed also the WHO European Office for the Prevention and Control of Non-Communicable Diseases. So it's a real pleasure to now hand the floor to uh, Dr. Joao Breda. I hope that he can hear us. Okay. Well, I, I just uh, yeah, noticed that it's not uh, available um, yet, and, and so perhaps we can um, collect further questions from, from the audience here, but also please uh, uh, don't be shy, submit your questions also in the, in the chat window uh, in Zoom, and we will make sure to, to collect, and of course uh, there will be uh, further discussions, follow-up uh, messages or emails uh, um, after the meeting. Um, so now I'll take Yes, Sabine, please. Yes, maybe because I forgot it earlier, uh, I can make a small advertisement for the World Health Summit this uh, fall, winter in uh, Berlin, where there will also be a special uh, sepsis session on addressing sepsis on the global and national level. I just wanted to leave that with all of you. I think some of you might be also involved, but also for your knowledge. So there's also a focus on that. Thanks. Thank you, very, very, very interesting. And now I'll hand the floor to you. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Roman Marek. I'm the CEO of the German Sepsis uh, Stiftung in Berlin. And of course, I also want to thank you, Teresa, for sharing your story. It was really very powerful, and I'm sure it took you a lot of strength. And uh, But coming back to the panel, as mentioned before, we are also very thankful to the German government. You mentioned the G7 declaration for the first time ever, mentioned sepsis in it. But uh, even before, the, the support for the World Health Summit, of course, but even before when uh, the um, uh, WHO sepsis resolution was uh, implemented, it was, uh, yeah, Germany was a driving force. So my question was, is, how can we help politicians or how can we foster the implementation of all that has uh, been decided before? You know, we have the facts, we have the scientific evidence, we have the numbers. What can we do to foster the implementation finally? Yes, um, again, complicated question. Um, uh, be, uh, seeing as, uh, and I don't want to say that um, time stopped a little bit uh, for normal measures, but we did have a pandemic, and unfortunately, uh, and I'm still seeing that there is, is still a pandemic, uh, um, uh, and uh, this has also had a significant uh, effect on everything in everybody in working in the governments and, and the focus that uh, was put on fighting the pandemic and, and therefore looking how to allocate resources. Uh, and right now I'm still seeing that in the ministries and all of the agencies, um, the pandemic is not over. So everybody is very hard at work and now trying to also do the normal uh, um, agenda, so to say, what needs to be done besides fighting the pandemic. But this all still has a lot to do with workload. And I can uh, assure you that at least for the German government, and I know the Federal Ministry of Health very well, my former colleagues there, that they're very much at work also tackling all of the other issues. But we have to say that the last two and a half, two 
three quarters uh, of uh, years um, were very much focused in that area. So resources sometimes were, were kept from um, fulfilling other promises that most definitely need to be worked on now again uh, with the former strength and, and effort and um, they are trying to do that but uh, we will th see I think in the coming months that it's getting more and more back to also having this. I mean, the G7 presidency right now that we're having, where uh, the colleagues in the capital uh, try to tackle all of the issues as well. Um, but it's a step in progress. And it's not only um, that I don't want to focus uh, too much on the ministries and agencies, but it's also for the hospitals and all of the uh, people working in healthcare that they um, uh, need to even try to keep up with the works they have because of the uh, things they have to do right now and the pressures. So it's uh, not easy, but it's uh, one step at a time, I think. Absolutely. Please. <laughs> now I have the chance to come back to data, right? <laughs> Uh, but I think it is important, actually, because, and, and that's another experience from the, uh, from the pandemic, to, to all the time see the numbers is what makes both politicians and, and general public to react and act. So, um, surveillance and data, not only monitoring of implementation in itself, but, but the actual outcome to, to have trustworthy representative and comparable data on incidents, on treatment um, outcome, for example. Uh, and that was the third pillar of the Swedish pathway, that is the correct diagnosis coding. And it, is, it might sound a bit you know, small in comparison with the important treatment parts, but it is, because with solid data, that's how to really move action. And it's not only for, for awareness raising, uh, though I think this is important, but it's also for, I mean, for the design of intervention. You have to know your situation and context before you can actually say how to move forward and, and what to implement. And then again to follow up, to be able to adjust, to assure that your interventions are working or going in the right direction. So, so I would really like to, to again, I mean, reiterate the importance of surveillance and data. Thank you. Just a word, because we are hosted by our German friends, and I would like to, to pay tribute to all the efforts of Germany and the German colleague, and also to pay tribute to Konrad Heinert, who did so much. For, the, for, for defending that cause at the WHO and at the European level. So we have to mention and keep in mind all the efforts that Konrad Heinert has done for, for this, addressing this problem. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we have another question. Yes, a very short one. Yes. Thanks, Laura. I know we don't have perhaps more time anymore, so perhaps rather than a question, a very quick comment. You can answer, of course. Um, we, we raised many, many points. Uh, yeah, data, um, uh, monitoring is uh, obligatory, you know, mandatory guidelines, etc. We, uh, European Services Alliance, sorry, I'm Simone Mancini from the European Services Alliance, in fact. And uh, we do believe there's a role for ECDC here, especially in view of the, uh, the extension of the mandate and uh, in relations with uh, other, you know, work, uh, you know, pillars uh, like AMR or pandemic preparedness and um, and I know they need the input from the European Commission from the member states and uh, I think that's perhaps will be one practical steps one practical you know call uh, to you all to the Commission to the member states uh, please do take that in consideration because I think today we have demonstrated the, the correlation the importance of looking at sepsis monitoring uh, preparing you know, guidelines in correlation with these uh, teams that are already ongoing uh, work streams. So we're not asking for anything new, we're asking for add-on and to expand, to, to, to look at the, to the broader picture, to look at an infection management in this, uh, perhaps in, with, a, with a broader uh, lens. Yeah. Thank you, Simone. Yes, Sabine. 
Uh, just quickly, because um, I feel like, uh, um, especially with sepsis and sepsis awareness, uh, all of the uh, members of the organizations here uh, working on sepsis awareness, you're do doing a really good job already in, in raising awareness. Uh, I know on the World Sepsis Day last week, uh, in Germany at least, in the parliament, uh, um, members of parliaments were approached with all of uh, uh, the numbers and issues, and I think that is what is needed. Um, um, uh, having the data uh, and uh, uh, writing in, uh, meeting, um, presenting your issues and, and showing uh, also solutions, possible solutions are also always very much welcome with members of parliaments uh, and, and also governments uh, and showing forward a way and working together and this is very important. So I can only uh, congratulate uh, all of those uh, um, included in this uh, campaign and, and sepsis uh, uh, organizations on their work that they're already doing. So this is very needed. Um. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, Sabine. And, uh, and now I think, well, this is a really um, a set of comprehensive and very powerful, you know, messages and recommendations so that will certainly be taken from all of us, from the, also the online audience in the near future. And hopefully we can uh, really boost and set up, uh, step up the actions at the different uh, levels, uh, at country level. And now, last but not least, I'm really um, delighted to give the floor to Dr. Joao Breda, who is finally with us. I did introduce a little, uh, you a little bit earlier, uh, so apologies for that, but... Um um, just a short reminder, Dr. Uh, Joao Breda is a special advisor of WHO Europe Regional Director for the establishment of sub-regional offices, and he's based in Greece. Until recently, he also uh, headed the WHO European Office for the Prevention and Control of NCDs, non-communicable diseases. Uh, I was uh, already mentioning, uh, Dr. Breda, that we are um, truly um, grateful for the support that you are showing uh, to, to the European and the global sepsis organizations. And, and so now we uh, also are quite keen to, to hear further reflections and what uh, your um, recommendations are to, to fully implement the uh, World Health Assembly resolution uh, across uh, European member states. Thank you. Thank you very much for the very kind introduction. And um, I am the one and our team, we are very grateful for you, this invitation and for you to involve us. It was really a great pleasure to participate at the event last week, let's say in the world scene. But it gives me, if I may say, even more pleasure today because uh, we are in Europe and we work as part of the WHO Regional Office for Europe and the member states involved here are, are the ones we work directly with. So it's it's a double pleasure to have worked last week with you and, and even today. And I really regret I cannot be there in person. I think this is always very important. Um, unfortunately, I, I am taking a day off today, but I couldn't miss really being with you. And therefore, I apologize in advance not being able to follow the entire the entire discussion but um what what i really would like to say as first thing is that it is no accident that we participated last week and we are here with you today and that i've been suggested and appointed and really requested by our regional director dr kluge and our uh, divisional director natasha zopardi to participate and to collaborate with you in these important events. It's really a, an agenda which is coming out very nicely. And we, as people responsible for quality of care and in providing support to quality of care for European member states, we take this very serious and we believe that this uh, area of work is extremely important. So full support we see with excitement how many uh, stakeholders you're able to engage and how much you've been really able to move forward with the agenda, which is, of course, we're always competing with something. We all have uh, striking figures when we're talking about health, whatever the areas where we are. But I think that we are, you are working on this very nicely. 
and we are delighted to be part of this team. As a way of maybe summarizing the discussions we've been involved in the last weeks, maybe I ask you to share my next slide, uh, really to sort of try to, if I could get the next one. Yes, I mean, here, really, we all understand that we have this uh, challenge of um, moving forward, but it's always very difficult without having the right data. The colleague from Sweden, I suppose, I really uh, associate with that motion, with the statement that data is very important. Of course, we need to focus on the clinical features and the prevention and all of that, but we really need to use the data if you want to move forward with advocacy. I'm not going to go into detail, but we also know about, it's, uh, I think, crystal clear, the morbidity and the mortality related with this problem. And therefore, we need really to address it properly. It has a serious contribution in terms of the SDGs. Particularly, we are very concerned with mother and child mortality. This is very serious in parts of our region, mostly in Eastern European countries. As you may know, for example, Central Asia and Republican Caucasus countries are part of the WHO European region. And here, it's in a way a different ballgame. These countries are a different situation compared with the most advanced and the richest EU countries. So a lot to be done to achieve SDGs. And therefore, uh, we also uh, we, we need to take this very seriously. Not only the SDG3 related with health, but also others, notably those related with inequalities, eventually SDG, SDG 10. We also say no... UHC without quality and sepsis and infection prevention and control, all these aspects dealing with this is a matter of really concern for uh, UHC. Therefore, we really need to, we have the context, which is very important, and we have the opportunity really to make the case. Next slide, please. So in a nutshell, the evidence was always there. We know how important the problem is. We need the, the political support, which we got at the World Health Assembly. Then first with, you know, with DB resolutions and then moving on to the WH and, and, and uh, then with a global action plan on patient safety, which incorporates a lot of important elements uh, that concern the topic at stake here today. I wouldn't say it's complete and gives us the full picture, but we do have very good hankers at the political level to advocate globally, European, but more important at the national, at the sub-national and the facility level for more action. Next slide, please. So the evidence is there now and and the, and the let's say the, the mandate is there for WHO as well, crystal clear. We need to do more at local and facility level. We need to support member states and the professionals. One of the things as an illustration we are doing, for example, moving forward in quality and the different dimensions of quality, which as you know, are like six, I'm not going to repeat it, is all relevant for uh, the topic at stake uh, that we have here in our hands. Just as an example, the primary health care for children and adolescents pocket book that we issued a few months ago really incorporates very clear guidance to deal with these problems at the facility, at the sub-regional, sub-national, and national level. So we are actually moving into practical aspects. We are walking the talk in terms of putting the effort where our mouth is, and we're also moving into PHC. Last week, a lot of people talking about PHC. This is not by far only about hospitals. It's very important that we go down to PHC as, as really uh, the entry point and the first um, dimension where we need to address the topic. Next slide, please. So really moving forward with uh, working on uh, the different levels of the health system, the different players, but also in our office in Athens, we are very much looking forward to the, uh, let's say, uh, you know, the novelty, the innovation aspects, going the extra mile. As we support with the traditional aspects, we really need to look into new ways 
of addressing these issues, notably, uh, namely about around sepsis. Therefore, aspects like harnessing the power of digital, working on uh, artificial intelligence and other aspects, social innovations that allow us to, for example, tackle um, the needs of the vulnerable groups, which are, of course, way more vulnerable to, and pardon the repetition, to issues related with, with sepsis is very important. So innovation and country support, this is very much what we are trying to do. Next slide, please. And I think that moving forward is very important that we incorporate all of this. So we understand that these aspects are essential. They are core, they are central to quality of care. Therefore, we moving forward, we want WHO is a evidence-based organization. We need the data, we need the figures, we need really more research. It's a common place to say that, but for this area is essential. And we also need to invest a lot more on prevention, early diagnosis and treatment. And we need to identify the factors that are protective. We all know healthy diet, physical activity, healthier lifestyles, they are protective. They are protective for on how we resist to COVID and, and infectious diseases in general, particularly respiratory ones. They are not, of course, a silver bullet, but they are important. So you're looking at health in a holistic manner, it's very important. We are clinicians many times, but my uh, call would also be for you to look at the big picture as well and at the preventive and protective factors and work on that together also with other players, notably those who are addressing NCDs and others. Next slide, please. So as, as almost as I finish, really very important. WHO, we are about in Europe, our regional director, Hans Kluge, very clearly said we need a dual track. He said that at his TED talk last week in Tel Aviv at the big meeting with all the countries, 53 in the room, he clearly said, is about we still have the pandemic at hand. Our, our colleague from Germany, I suppose, was very clear saying that. We fully support and agree with that. Moving forward, really make sure that we leave no one behind. We have a dual track approach, but we focus more in vulnerable groups. Quality is much lower when we talk about vulnerable populations. I really like the statement that is part of the was part of the Lancet Commission, let's say, motto on quality of care, where they clearly said poor quality normally is for the poor, and we need really to address that. So it's it's very important. Leaving no one behind, dual track, European program of work, it's all there. Next slide, please. Well, how do we support member states and how we move forward? Well, we really need to uh, have also resources and political support. We have that in Greece. We started one year ago. We already have more than 20 people working together, moving on, building the team, but great support from the government of Greece. Unbelievable, incredible, and we are very grateful. You see Prime Minister Mitsotakis here inaugurating our new premises and count on us to continue to work together and really do more on this. Next slide, please. Basically, and in a nutshell, is really about serving our constituents, the member states, and other stakeholders in the region. Rest assured, we work hand in hand with, at the moment, we have projects in 12 countries on quality of care and patient safety. And of course, these topics today are part of it, but we are very keen to explore more opportunities to work together. And as I said, we would like to be a hub of excellence the, really the place where people look to when we are talking about quality of care, and therefore we are very much into being in the future the center of innovation for quality of care, including sepsis as well. So I think I would stop here. I really appreciate the opportunity and look forward to continue to work together. Thank you very much, I, and I yield the floor back to the chair. Thank you very much. 
thank you very much uh, from our side, uh, Dr. Breda, for uh, highlighting really the major um, uh, objectives and uh, achievements of the WHO and for your really were deeply uh, pleased about the collaboration uh, in the last years and for your continuous support. So now we uh, arrive at the end of our discussion. Um, I really want to, to thank once again all the distinguished speakers and uh, also a special thanks to, to Teresa for having shared her personal story with us, which is, has been uh, quite um, relevant and uh, very, very special in today's discussion. Um, we have a, a, certainly um, a lot of room for, for improvement, but uh, we have uh, um, this debate with all the high level recommendations have um, paved the way for, for future work and further actions that can be taken from all of us. And uh, I personally, and of course, the, the European Sepsis Alliance looks forward to, to working with as many uh, like-minded organizations, experts, institutions, uh, academics uh, as possible uh, to advance the discussions because our actions not only uh, and protect uh, safety for, for patients, healthcare professionals, uh, and ultimately contribute to, to the resilience and sustainability of uh, uh, the, the European healthcare systems, as well as being in line with the uh, United Nations Sustainable Development Goal as well, as we just heard from, from Dr. Breda. So thank you very much for having listened to us, especially to our online uh, audience as well. Um, I'm sure there, there, there are questions in the chat uh, which we can uh, follow up uh, in, uh, in due course in the next days. Please feel free to, you know, to continue to follow the activity of the European and Global Sepsis Alliance um, and uh, do not uh, hesitate also to contact us uh, by email as well to further discuss um, uh, these very interesting and relevant points um, uh, that we heard today. Thank you very much. It's been an honor to, to chair this meeting. And now I wish you a very um, pleasant day. I'm aware that we have also a tasty foods uh, with us. So thank you once again. And also for, to the online audience for joining us.